Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to talk. My, uh, I want to start my talk about defining ranks um, phylogenetically and quantitatively with, uh, with some examples from fungal data, with a very brief historical overview. As you all know, it was Linnaeus who introduced hierarchical classification into biology, and it also was Linnaeus who defined and used taxonomic ranks. But it was also not before Darwin that a causal explanation has been found why we find such a hierarchical structure in nature in the first place regarding organisms. And Darwin already predicted that our classifications will come to be genealogies, as he put it. We would now say phylogenies, um, which was actually a little bit of overkill because we all know that we have to summarize the phylogenies we can't just mirror them in taxonomic classification. Then Hennig made clear that in order to act as a summary of the phylogeny, taxa must be mon monophyletic. And the reason why I'm listing this here is that it is historically obvious that taxonomic ranks had been introduced before it was clear that taxonomic classification has to do with phylogeny. So the question is, of which use are taxonomic ranks now? And the problem is apparently the taxa of the same rank are seldom comparable. And there are two solutions to this perceived problem. One of them is to abandon them altogether, which is, pro for instance, something the phylo code is doing. And the other solution, which is also obvious but maybe more difficult, is to make them comparable. But I think the question is quite difficult because depending on the taxonomic discipline, that is, depending on botany, zoology, um, mycology and, microbi and mi microbiology, it was totally different which kinds of solutions has been, have been used or suggested for this problem because these disturbances were partially quite independent of each other. Um, I would like to introduce a very simple concept of, of consistency in assigning ranks. It quite simply means that no taxon of a lower rank should be more divergent than a taxon of a higher rank, for instance, no genus should be less divergent than a species. No family should be less divergent than a genus. And this can be phrased rather um, generally, even, even if it's not yet known which measure of divergence should be used. But apparently, this indicates that we should use divergence boundaries to separate the ranks. Now, this is something that is actually done in microbiology in the classification of archaea and bacteria for quite a long time. Um, for instance, you probably know that DNA, DNA hybridization with a 70% similarity threshold has been used very frequently and is still the, is still the gold standard for defining uh, bacterial species. This can actually now be replaced by genome comparisons, that is, the distances, intergenomic distances between completely sequenced genomes give you an approximate um, version of such a DNA, DNA hybridization value, and of course the error ratio is much lower. Um, much more frequently used because it's more easier and can be applied to more ranks is 16 rna sequencing. Indeed, microbiology started to request 16 rna sequences with each new species description long before the barcoding projects started for eukaryotes. And a very recent paper, Nature Reviews Microbiology, then reviewed the entire topic and defined um, minimum sequence identities or maximum sequence distances for each taxonomic rank, that is, genus, family, order, class, phylum, with um, 16S being hold not particularly reliable regarding a species rank, but for all other ranks, this has been introduced. And these thresholds have been suggested by estimating them from the existing taxa, that is, the minimum sequence identity found in genera, families, and so, on, and so on, was then used to define a new threshold. Um, and this has the, the advantage that we can try to maximize taxonomic conservatism if we use um, the actual thresholds or maximum values for uh, something normative, but it also has the advantages that we can indeed quantitatively define ranks. I nevertheless have two objections here, and one of them refers to the use of pairwise distances. As you all know, if the data are not ultramatic, that is, if the sequences have not been 
a volt on the molecular clock. Um, pairwise distances do not necessarily lead to, or clustering using pairwise distances with a certain threshold does not necessarily lead to monophyletic groups. And we can see inconsistencies in the clusters. That is, if we have used a certain threshold, we will then nevertheless find uh, within cluster distances above the threshold and between cluster distances below the threshold. And this, is, this analysis was done for exactly the 6NS RNA data, data set that was used in the paper I was referring to. And as you see here, this works very well for small distances, but then um, clustering consistency goes down. And if you look for the proportion of clusters that are entirely consistent in this respect, we see that this go proportion goes down very rapidly. And it only gets better again if we put all bacteria and archaea into a single cluster, which is probably not very useful. Now, um, this is uh, actually only the first part of what's suggested as an approach to define new taxa of a certain rank. You see, this is quite complicated. For instance, um, you start with candidate taxonomic units, which are defined by sequence clustering using those taxonomic thresholds. And then you try to align this with a phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree using so-called oper or defining operational phylogenetic units, which should contain at least 70% of the members of a given Operational, operational taxonomy units, and I won't even try to explain you in the next paragraph. So this sounds to be, sounds to be quite complicated, and what we find here is the mixture between a clustering logic using 6NS six in, uh, using six in similarity or distance and phylogenetic, phylogenetic logic emphasizing a phylogeny used, uh, uh, derived using quite different methods and emphasizing monophyly. Um, we, we can see this here also, um, indeed, if pairwise distances are used, that is raw similarity, raw sequence distance, then we can compare this to patristic or path length distances derived um, from a tree inferred from the very same data. And as you see here, these uh, uncorrected distances are only a, quite a pure estimator of the patristic distances which we can infer from the tree. But I don't want to say here that the maximum patristic distance would be a good replacement. Um, another objection is the kind um, we infer those normative um, rank boundaries from given taxa from with given ranks, uh, because the study I was referring to used the maximum divergence or maximum distance or minimum similarity for each rank. That is, in this hypothetical example data set, we here have a couple of genera with different divergence values and a couple of families also with diff distinct divergence values. And if we use the maximum divergence of the genera to, to define the boundary, we here would have to revise three families because they are too small. And thus, that should be included in some other family and maybe made uh, just reduced to a genus. But the optimal boundary, which, which can be placed here for the very same data, would result only in two taxonomic modifications to be made because only one genus would be too large and only one family would be too small. And this means that we should take care when estimating the upper boundaries for each rank from empirical data. And I don't think that the maximum found is really the best one. Statistical methods should be used, such as recursive partitioning, to find the best value instead. instead. Now, if we want to switch from um, pairwise distances and clustering logic to phylogenetic logic, we apparently have to estimate the divergence from phylogenetic trees. That is, each subtree should have a divergence value. Um, this is easy if the tree is indeed ultrametric, because in that case, many of the measures that could be applied are equivalent. For instance, the maximum dis patristic distance between the group A, B, C, D is 3 plus 1 plus 4 is 8. And this is also always identical in such a case to twice the subtree height. And it's also guaranteed in such an ultrametric tree that a subtree has always a lower patristic dis maximum patristic distance than um, its parent subtree. As you see here, A, B has uh, 6 and A, B, C has 8 and so on. This is not the, not the case in a non ultrametric tree. If we, for instance, here look for the maximum distance within a subtree AB, then we find nine. 
And if we look into subtree A, B, and C, then the maximum distance is still between A and B, and also 9. So we run into ties, which is not a very good situation for estimating the best boundaries. So this must be done differently in using other metrics, but it's obvious that it can be inferred from subtrees. Another issue that must be solved is assigning taxa to subtrees or nodes in a rooted tree in the first place. This seems rather trivial, and it is indeed trivial if the taxa are monophyletic. In the, those cases, it is rather straightforward to assign them. But there are apparently also nodes that can and should not be assigned to a single taxon only. For instance, this node here bears two genera, this node here bears three genera, this node bears four, and only here we arrive at an entire subfamily. This example is from zoology. Um, similarly, um, what should we do with monotypic taxa? This should also be solved, otherwise we run into the problem of measuring things twice. And a polyphyletic taxon will most likely be assigned to many nodes, which is also trivial, but can lead to problems if you estimate the rank boundaries. As you can imagine, this will, would then later on by an algorithm treat it as if we had um, many distinct taxa, and of, of, in that case it will, of course, lower the boundary. Similarly, paraphyletic taxa cannot be, aligned, cannot be assigned to a single node, at least not alone. But this can also be solved algorithmically, and I would now go to the first fungal data, so the main fungal data set here. Um, this Onigenelles data set has only recently been created, and for this reason I can only pro provide and show a very preliminary uh, analysis of the data. An impressive amount of sequences has been generated at CBS, but as usual in such data sets, we have seen, heard many examples today, these uh, genes are not necessarily distributed in an easy way because this, does not, this, for instance, does not mean that we have 300 sequences for all of them. Um, the bar you see here is not a technical error, but this represents the data set. Black means the gene is there. White means the gene is not there. So we have the usual random arrangement. Um, for the moment, I have analyzed only a subset of the data for which the five genes are available for all taxa involved, but I don't think this is an optimal trade-off between taxon sampling and gene sampling. For this reason, the analysis is quite preliminary. Um, and you can't read the tree here. I think you are used to unreadable trees in presentations. But on the other hand, Cyprin has given you a very nice introduction to the group. What you see here is that we have very few green nodes, which represent the monophyletic taxon, and many, many red nodes which are nodes that conflict with the classification in some way or the other. And the first reason, rather trivial reason, is that in such input classification, classifications, we usually have a mixture of anamorphs and teleomorphic names. And while being trivial, trivial for mycologist, for a computer program, this cannot be distinguished from a classification that indeed contains many non-monophyletic non groups. But even if we remove, um, uh, if we restrict the data set to only the anamorphs or make another partition with only the teleomorphic names, many of the taxa are not monophyletic. For instance, we have only about 50% of the genera that are monophyletic, about only 60% of the species that appear monophyletic. So the question is, if the data, if the taxonomy is such a mess here, how can we estimate rank boundaries if we consider that we should estimate them only from monophyletic groups. Now, um, for this reason, I made the following approach. I removed taxa for each taxonomic rank. I re just removed the taxa that cause non-monophyly non in the tree, and then estimated the boundary only for the remaining taxa, and I did this independently for each rank, and then I went back, applied the boundaries to the tree, and looked what happened. Um, this picture shows you um, the estimated divergences per rank. We see that there's some overlap between species and genera, little overlap at the moment between families and genera, but here we have certain nodes that are, have a little, very low divergence, which contain several genera, which also doesn't look very nice. Um, this a little bit boring box plot can be replaced by something more complicated, but hopefully more informative. What you see here is my attempt to put all relevant information in one picture. 
Now, each dot is a node in the rooted phylogeny that is a subtree. Um, and on this axis, we see the ranks. That is here, rank two. These are the species. These nodes correspond to a genus. These nodes correspond to a family. And the nodes in between correspond to several genera, but not yet a family, or several species, but not yet a genus. And here you have some boundaries, and please note that they have been estimated from exactly this data set. And as you see, some of the nodes are within the rectangle. These are fine. These are also fine, but we see many, um, many nodes which are outside of these rectangles, and these apparently don't have the right divergence value according to this analysis. Now, the shading I've used here represents branch support, that is, the black ones are those with 100% support. There's a lot of information in the data set, actually. And the nodes that deviate are apparently not unsupported nodes, nodes that don't matter anyway, because we shouldn't have placed a tax on there. But here we have a real conflict. Now, based on these data, we can, however, automatically rearrange the data sets and reach something like this where species, genera, families, and orders, well, there's only, well, only two orders in the data set, all very well separated regarding their divergence values. And if we look at the comprehensive picture showing all nodes, we see that now almost everything has been sorted out. Here we see species and below, genera and below, family and below, and only very few nodes which have no support anyway are outside of the range of the um, of the boundaries for the rank. Now, uh, this is the tree. You see that here not only everything is monophyletic, which is clear because it, the taxa have been constructed using this phylogeny, but on the other hand, we have no taxa that deviate. All of them are marked in green. Um, important, very important uh, um, This will be done on the next slide. Here we see a comparison of the old and the new classification. We, we see that we now have almost the same number of species, um, but here this is a mixture of anamorphic and telomorphic species names, so actually we have a little bit more reality. We have more genera now, mainly because many of the input genera have not been uh, monophyletic, and we have a little bit more families also to solve the problem, but regarding the uh, number of organisms, this uh, species genus family also sit on the straight lines, so this is quite similar to what we had before. Um, this is the picture again, and what I want to emphasize here is that this method does not yield a single optimal solution, but there are many options. For instance, here we have partially very broad boundaries for rank, so we could very freely operate and merge or split taxa as long as we stay within those ranks, and I think this is important because this means that other information, for instance, phenotypic characters that could delineate such taxa could be quite easily integrated here, depending on their distribution. Um, and having shown this example, I wanted to discuss a couple of potential general objections here. Now, the first one is that these rank boundaries are arbitrary. To some degree, clearly they are, but they have been estimated from existing taxa, and for this reason, I think, reflect already existing biological or taxonomic information. Another uh, issue is that um, enforcing consistency of the ranks might lead to many taxonomic changes, but um, using the this way of estimating boundaries, we can actually try to minimize the number of necessi necessary taxonomic changes because we optimize it precisely, the boundaries precisely for that purpose. And there are, at, uh, at the moment, apparently many other reasons for reclassifications, for instance, non monophyletic groups or dual nomenclature and so on. Another most, very much more serious issue is that, is that we cannot expect ranks to be made comparable between very uh, distinct groups of organisms. For instance, we can't expect to have a yeast species and a species of mammal to be comparable regarding the divergence, but I think this doesn't really matter because the taxonomic con communities um, working with those, um, and I'm not talking about the not only talking about the taxonomists, also think about the users, they hardly overlap, and I think they do not expect to, uh, that these taxa are comparable. 
Um, the measure ch chosen here, which is based on subcreated, I think um, is optimal compared to alternative measures. So this, I can't go into detail here, but this could also be a potential objection. Um, another one is that the method does not yield a single best solution. This I think I have already mentioned. I think this is actually an advantage. Another potential problem could be that a certain taxon should be kept on, and re the rank should be retained, but if such a priori preferences are there, they can enter the estimation process because certain taxa can be upweighted. Um, we cannot transfer the rank boundaries between distinct genes. This is clear, but we can re-estimate them. And another issue is that increased taxon sampling might yield to the boundaries not fitting taxa anymore, but in that case, I would suggest to just re-estimate the boundaries because the boundaries themselves don't matter. It is consistency of the ranks, which I think matters. Now, because it has been mentioned this morning, I wanted to, yes? Hmm? Okay, because it has been mentioned this morning, I wanted to compare the method here with a, uh, sorry, with a modified GMYC method suggested and presented by Thorsten Lumsch, um, because we had at least one data set to which both methods had been applied. In that case, it's a data set with a yeast. Uh, for yeast classification, agaricomicotina yeast, um, a 17 data set with 190 leaves in the trees. I got several preliminary classifications and version three was made, I think, using the GMYC method and I had to analyze them and improve them if possible according to my criteria. And uh, this is classification number three made using the modified GMYC approach. What you see here that um, some rank boundaries are very small. In that case, I think this is for family and we have the usual um, deviating nodes here, here, here and here. I think species and rank, species and varieties don't matter, but these two matter. So um, this is according to uh, the consistency criterion, not optimal. We see this also here in the tree where we have a couple of taxa that are too large and others that are too small. Um, now, if we modify the, mo the classification to obtain consistency of the ranks, we get a little bit more broad boundaries. Again, this is not the only optimal solution, but one of them. We have only very few nodes which are outside the range of divergences, but these are not very well supported. But the majority of the nodes now fit within their boundaries and we guarantee consistency of the ranks. We see this here where, with, respect, uh, with the single exception of the outgroup, which doesn't matter here anyway, um, all taxa are within the envisaged ranks. So I think um, regarding the comparability of taxa, um, my method um, arrives at such a comparability, but my view is biased here, of course, and normally if you um, judge one method using the criteria of the other method, you will always have such a bias. But anyway, I think I wanted to show this um, comparison because it seems interesting here. Um, I want to thank um, the group of Sip and Hoch at CBS for the owning analysis data set, which I have here preliminarily analyzed. And um, the yeast cooperators from China and also from CBS for the yeast data set used here, Tos Lumsch and my colleagues from DSMC and Braunschweig University for many helpful discussions. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>